Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Past and the Curious. My name is Mick Sullivan, and this is episode four of our special series, The Underwear Chronicles. This episode is a chapter from a book that I wrote, and it is about Satchel Paige, one of the coolest baseball players who was actually a guitar player and a singer. I was really excited to learn that. Uh, I found a picture of him playing a guitar that, oh boy, I would like to have it. Wonder where it is. Anyway, uh, I hope you enjoy this episode. Um, I have some big, 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 big news, and I'm going to share it live on March 3rd. March 3rd happens to be the anniversary of the Kentucky Meat Shower, and for the last two years, I have read my book about the Kentucky Meat Shower on YouTube Live, and there's a link that I'll put on my website. I'll tell you more about it at the end. Um, So I'm going to do that again. This will be the third year in a row that I will have done that. March 3rd, I'll post times and everything. Um, But that will also be coming with a really big, really exciting announcement. So I would love it if you joined or stayed tuned. I'll fill you in if you can't make it. But, oh, I'll tell you a little bit more at the end. Let's get started with the show, though. Some people earn their first paychecks scooping ice cream or sweeping floors. Leroy Page earned his first dime carrying underwear around the train station in Mobile, Alabama. His mother had sent them there to earn some extra money for the family. For 10 cents, Leroy would sling bags and suitcases and satchels over his shoulder and carry them to departing trains for tired travelers. He wasn't alone. There were several other kids there competing for the same few dimes. But lanky Leroy had an advantage in size and he knew how to hustle, so he usually managed to carry a few more bags than the others. Ten cents might have been more valuable in 1920 than it is today, but Leroy wasn't exactly bringing home the bacon. Other family members were working too, but the huge family needed him to earn more. The truth was obvious. There's only so many bags a lanky kid can carry, even with a strong body and a helpful hustle. Like a train arriving in the station, the solution to his problem popped into his head. Luckily, that's not where it hit him, because the solution was a big, heavy stick. Page claimed that his new stick-based solution was actually how he earned the nickname he would answer to for the rest of his life. While other boys were just hauling one or two bags from here to there, Leroy would be tying as many as a dozen bags to his big stick. By slinging it over his shoulder and balancing it as he walked, he was able to carry four times as many bags as before. This put four times as many dimes into his pocket. To everyone at the station, the solution was a funny sight to see. As the long, lumbering, bag-dangling branch weaved through the hallways, one startled person exclaimed that he looked like a walking satchel tree. And soon, Satchel became his name. Satchel's big family was about as poor as poor gets. Everything, even underwear, had to be shared. Constantly, the pages were trying to cut corners and save money. This meant that they moved a lot, and each time it was the same. They'd squeeze almost a dozen family members into another tiny rental shack, like a sack bulging with too many potatoes. This was probably another reason why he spent so much time at the station, There was no room at home. As helpful as he was to his family, he did give his mom some heartburn and sleepless nights with his poor behavior. Another story says Satchel's name didn't come from his money-making satchel stick at all, but instead because he got caught red-handed sneaking off with someone else's satchel. The story of Satchel stealing satchels Seems reasonable, though, because not long after working the train station for spare change, he wound up working involuntarily at the Alabama Reform School. It broke his mom's heart, because it was basically a jail for young boys. Or so they thought when they first heard the judge's orders. As it would turn out, it was a home inspired by a famous man named Booker T. Washington. He believed in reform through hard work and learning skills, which would very much be the case with young Satchel. As he grew into a young man, Satchel would become a very different person than the one who first walked through those doors. He went to class, which was something he had never done before. He milked cows. He tended a garden. 
and he turned head singing lead in the choir. He also met a baseball coach who changed his life. Baseball was something he had casually played with his friends between chores and the train station, but he had never thought that he could take it seriously. The coach realized this long, lanky kid had a body made for pitching. This wasn't exactly a surprise to Satchel. He could whip an oyster shell like cannon shot and take the bark off of a tree at 30 paces. Rumors spread, probably by Satchel, that he could knock a bird right out of the sky with one rock. There's probably some truth to that, because part of what landed him in reform school was a rock that he had hurled at another boy during a disagreement. Witnesses recalled how precisely and how quickly the stone found its way to the boy's backside. Thanks to encouragement from the coach, any free moment that Satchel had was spent throwing a baseball. One pitch was all he had, a fastball. But it was super fast, so it was really all that he needed. Four years later, he returned home to a mother who was truly impressed with how her son had grown. Then she made it clear that while it was really great to see him and all, the family was still dirt poor. Almost immediately, she sent him back out to earn money. A regular job didn't sound like much fun to him, though, and he definitely wasn't going back to the train station to haul people's undies. Throughout the South, there were amateur baseball teams looking for good players, so Satchel went for a tryout. As soon as they saw him throw his fastball, he was hired. Playing baseball was a fun job. Unfortunately, these amateur teams just didn't pay enough to live on. A dollar a day was hardly enough to feed himself, let alone his family members. So he set his sights on the professional sports league for black players known at the time as the Negro Leagues. At this time in America, there was a completely unfair and racist rule that black players could not play on a major league baseball team. So while players like Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth were on the sports page daily, there were hundreds of black players who were just as good or better playing incredible baseball every day. Hardly anyone would ever learn their names because the Negro Leagues were not covered by most newspapers or radio. At least not until Satchel Paige came along. Satchel was nearly empty-handed in 1926 when he showed up to join one of the more promising teams in Chattanooga. All he carried was a brown paper bag stuffed with a few meager possessions two pairs of socks, one pair of dusty hand-me-down pants, and wrapped up and hidden in the pants was an extra pair of plain old worn-out underwear. Looking at his established and well-dressed teammates, it ate him up that he was still wearing old worn-out clothes. That first paycheck couldn't come fast enough. When payday finally rolled around, he sent most of his monthly $250 stipend to his mom. With a few bucks he held on to, he treated himself to a really nice outfit and some new underwear, too. He pitched the old stuff in the trash and never looked back. From that point on, it was his goal to only cover himself in nice clothes. And it didn't take long for Satchel to become an absolute star. Natural talent and hard work made him an incredible athlete, and his pitching ability exploded with the experience he was gathering on the mound. Fans watched him pitch shutouts and no-hitters, and they were delighted by the drama of dust-ups and confrontations that he had with players and umps. Satchel put on a show wherever he went, and the crowds started coming to witness not just his pitching, but his enormous personality. Ticket sales skyrocketed. To the frustration of many team owners, Satchel didn't pay much attention to the contracts that he signed. Any given year, he might pitch for four or five different teams, bouncing around from town to town. Wherever they were paying, he was happy to show up and pitch. Despite this nomadic approach to teams, he earned a spot on the biggest field of his career up to that point. A series of exhibition games between Negro League All-Stars and the all-white Major League All-Stars would give him a chance to prove himself against the players that everyone knew from the papers and the radio. Just like he knew he would, Satchel stood out and gave all the players fits. Legendary New York Yankee Joe DiMaggio said Page was the best pitcher he had ever seen. 
Satchel could whip a baseball by just about anyone and leave them dumbfounded. It didn't matter what they looked like, where they came from, or what they believed. Satchel struck them all out. There was even a famous barnstorming team filled with fanatically religious men who believed it was a sin to cut their beards and hair. In addition to the hair thing, these guys believed that the world would be ending soon, so they must have figured, well, we might as well go out having fun. So playing baseball with beards down to their belts was a way to pass time and save some souls. Satchel struck those guys out too. They must have been impressed because afterwards they actually hired him to pitch a few games. Satchel never really gave a clear answer though on whether he wore a fake beard to fit in. It's believed that at the height of his career in the Negro Leagues, he was earning more money than the President of the United States, and certainly more than most of the players in the major leagues. He had a chauffeur to drive his big fancy car around, and stuffed into his beautiful luggage cases, he had 40 of the finest suits, all tailored to his long, lanky frame. Gone were the days of rough sackcloth undies, or, if he was lucky, some cotton hand-me-downs. Satchel filled his closets and suitcases with custom-made underwear of every color, sporting vivid flower patterns and made of the softest silk that money could buy. Despite all of the silk and flowers, one big thorn stuck in his side. He couldn't play in the majors. The attention and fame he earned had done a lot to fight racism, simply by proving that an African-American man could play, earn, and entertain as well as any white athletes. But it was not Satchel who would break the color barrier in baseball in 1947. It was his former teammate, a 28-year-old phenom named Jackie Robinson. The next year, the Cleveland Indians, hot in pursuit of a World Series championship, called on Satchel Paige to join the Major League team. When he made his debut, he was 42 years old, by far the oldest rookie in baseball. Cleveland would win the World Series that year with a lot of help from Satchel, but the rest of his six years in the Major would not be as impressive as his career in the other leagues. By the time he left the Majors, he was almost 50. You can do a lot when you're 50, But professional baseball is not usually one of those things. Even though he was retired, his legend grew, and there were not many names that excited baseball fans like Satchel's. So, in 1965, when the owner of the Kansas City Athletics wanted to bring out a huge crowd, he knew just what to do. He created Satchel Page Appreciation Night and hired the 59-year-old pitcher to take the mound and prove that he still had plenty of gas in the tank. Satchel didn't shy away from the chance to put on a show. The audience roared with laughter as he sat next to the bullpen, gently rocking in a rocking chair, looking like an old man. Occasionally, a nurse would come by to check on him. It was all an act, like pre-show drama and professional wrestling. When they got him to the mound, he moved like a man half his age. This was the moment that he became the oldest man to play professional baseball. While some people doubted his physical ability at this age, Satchel had nothing but confidence in himself. He pitched for three innings and gave up only one hit. Every other batter was sent back to the dugout in shame. After throwing his last pitch, a pitch that would be the last of his remarkable career, he stood on the diamond and soaked in the adoration of a well-deserved standing ovation. Before the fans had a chance to finish, he tipped his cap one last time, smiled, and headed to the locker room to clean up. He had already taken off his pants when someone rushed into the locker room looking for the pitcher. The messenger found Satchel standing there in nothing but his underwear, and Satchel was surprised to hear that they wanted him back on the field. This was confusing because once a player leaves the game, he can't go back in. So Satchel pulled his pants back up over his underwear, and as he made it to the door, he heard a stadium full of people singing. Standing on the field again, he realized the song was for him. The crowd, now holding candles, cheered when he reappeared, and they sang a song, Old Gray Mare, for the one and only Satchel Page. It was a good thing he put his pants back on.
Okay, March 3rd is right around the corner. It's just a couple weeks away, depending on when you listen to this. It might be tomorrow. I don't know. Or you might have already missed it. Sorry if you did. Anyway, March 3rd, 2022. I'm going to read The Meat Shower in honor of The Actual Kentucky Meat Shower, which happened on March 3rd, 1876. It's a book that I wrote. It's a lot of fun. I'd love to share it with you. It's the third year in a row I've done it. But there's also a really, really big announcement, and I hope you'll join us and check it out. Um, I will try to do it live on Instagram, too. But definitely, it's going to be a YouTube link. You can find the YouTube link on the website, thepastandthecurious.com. I'm going to do it twice. I'm going to do it at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on March 3rd, and I'm going to do it at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you do the math depending on where you are. But please join us. I would be thrilled. I'd be honored. And it's become a thing. I want you to be a part of it. So um, until I talk to you again, you know, happy meat shower day, everybody. And I'm really excited to tell you my news.